Okay, so today we're going to combine concepts of what we've been learning of JavaScript so far and expand upon them, concepts of HTML and CSS. Let me show you the hands-on example of what we're going to end up with, a variation of what we're going to end up with. If you open your web browser, open any web browser and then And I'll show you something here. So you open your web browser. Actually, a little thing before what I want to show you. I forgot to mention it previously. But one of the best places to get the most information on JavaScript, if you want to further your knowledge, we mentioned previously w3schools.com, which is a place to take these lessons and gain these concepts on HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and a lot of other things. Now, what I want to mention is if you go to developer.mozilla.com, if you recall, uh, Mozilla, which its progenitor was Netscape, were the ones that developed uh, JavaScript back in the 90s, around 1994, I believe, maybe 92, uh, the Netscape browser company invented JavaScript, and Netscape eventually morphed into Mozilla. And they still carry the torch, and they still have a big say in the development of the language. So going straight to the horse's mouth, developer.mozilla.org uh, gives you the Mozilla Developer Network. And you'll, he and you'll see here all of these tutorials and lessons and documentations and such on all of these web platforms, such as JavaScript. So you'll see there you'll see there the full list of all JavaScript keywords, tutorials and how it all works. Because again in this class, we'll only be able to get to a certain point, and if you want to further your knowledge, there's plenty of tutorials out there. This is one of the good ones, straight from the horse's mouth, the Mozilla Developer Network. What I want to show you right now about what we're going to end up with, if you go over to vmcink.net slash random, go ahead and go to that address, vmcink.net slash random, Right, so this is the random name picker. The point of this is that we can save some names, we can retrieve some names in different ways. So let's say I'm going to put in some names here. So there's some user input. This is functional in that I can input some names. I can then have it display all the names that I input. I can get one random name that I input. Different random name every time, of course. And then retrieve all the names in a random order every time. If I then want to start over with different names, I can delete all the names. It'll ask for confirmation do that and all the names are gone. Get me a random name, well there's no names to display. Get me you know, all the names saved, there's no name saved. So this is what we're going to end up with and um, this will put into play some things that we've learned so far and um, a few more things of course. If there's some way that you know, perhaps you can get a head start in what we're about to do. What we'll be doing then is creating this project from scratch. And as often as possible, I will try to put out a version of it out there before we start a lesson. Just so that if you're a little bit more advanced and you want to get a little bit further, you might want to look at the end result first and play with that. But I'll be starting from scratch on this project. We'll be starting from scratch. 
on this project. So that's our basic idea. So that means we uh, then need to go over to Notepad++. Go ahead and launch Notepad++, start a new file. I'm going to start another new file one more time. We'll go through this relatively quickly. We're going to start a new file, and we're going to create those 10 lines of code one more time. That very basic project, I'm going to call this uh, randomnames.html, perhaps. We're going to write the, the, the quick 10-line HTML5 project. Perhaps if you had saved a clean version of what we've done before, this could just be a little bit of copy and paste to get you started. Or if you're new to HTML, a little bit of practice doesn't hurt. And so we've done this a few times before. And we're not going to start over every single time, but it behooves us to practice one more time. And so I'm done. You are too, right? I'll give you guys a moment. Let's go up and type these 10 lines or so, and we'll uh, get started in a moment. obviously more impressive if I don't make any mistakes. And I don't think I did it, so it is impressive. So we'll create this basic uh, document. Uh, we'll write a little HTML for our content. We'll style it nicely a little bit later with some CSS. But we're going to focus mostly on some JavaScript. And everything that you saw a moment ago, about that random name stuff, that's about 100 lines of code. So we're going to see that when we need to make any sort of app or program, as a user, we see the end result. I see that I go to File, New, and it creates a file. Internally, that's probably like dozens of lines of code you saw on that random name picker. I type in a name, click go, it saves it. I type in give me a random one, it does it. Internally, there's dozens of lines of code that do that. So we're going to see then that we're going to be in, in charge of all of this, about the possibilities of what we need to do and to figure out what's the best way to handle it, how to you know, get user input and output and all that good stuff. And so, at about 100, and 100 lines, 120 lines, or whatever that was, um, we need to be in charge of it. And we're going to see several times that, uh, or hopefully we're going to see and understand why, why are there, you know, patches released to software? Why are there updates? Why are there changes? Because software is created by people, and people sometimes make mistakes. And when there's teams of people, the mistakes could increase. So we're going to see then, as uh, app developers, we're going to need to be in charge of all of that. Errors and bugs and bug fixing and all of that. Let's see if I've got mine looking OK so far. You should have something basically basic like that. Ten lines. The big idea, first of all, is that we need to get some user input. Those are input boxes. We need to ask the user, give us some names. So we have an HTML construct. We have some HTML tags that will allow us to do that. In the body section, we're going to create a form. A form is a container that will allow us to accept user input. You see a form all the time. Let's say you go off to Facebook and you're going to log in. It asks for a username and password and then log in. That's a form. If you're filling out some sort of application online, that's a form. It's asking you for last name, first name, age, income, etc. and then submit. It's a form. It's input. So the form tag will allow us to accept user input. 
inside of the form block, we will create something called a field set that has an opening and closing tab or tag field set. The field set is a way for us to create an input form that is more user friendly. Let's say you're filling in an application for employment. Uh, it may ask you personal information, it may then ask you professional information, job experience information, three different kinds of information. So those three kinds of information can be separated into a field set. This part of the form is about the personal information. This part of the form is about the uh, professional information. And this other part of the form is about the uh, experience. So that's what a field set is. It's what's the kind of data that we're getting, uh, that we're asking for. This um, has a legend. This is what delineates to the user what's this section about. So, uh, random name picker, let's say. This section is about a random name picker. We can have other things that we're, that we're getting input. And so we would create a different field set for that section, and then a different uh, legend uh, to, to mark what it looks like on screen. Uh, if you view it in the browser, it looks something like this. Created like a little section. Think of it also like in terms of if I'm if if I'm doing a resume, it doesn't quite follow. But if I'm if I've got a resume, I have a section for this content, that content, this content. So a field set separates content, one content from other content. And it's interesting basic design that comes in. Random name picker appears there in a little box. It automatically created this sort of visual container. There's a visual container here, but there's also a conceptual container. Next line, line 12. the tag input. This is going to accept some, some input, like an input box. Um, this is one of the tags that does not have a pair, but it has attributes. So I'll give it, we need to give it the attribute of type. And that's the syntax for attributes. This is an input. We're going to accept a certain type of data. The type of data is text. If you view the browser, input box. Now we have a box where people can type in a name. This is an input element. It exists inside of the form element. It's type, it's text. We can have it accept text. We can have it accept numbers. We can have it accept an email address. Yes? Yeah, all of this that we're writing is so far HTML because we're not in a, we're not in a script block. If we were in a script block, it would be then JavaScript. Because what if you're trying to do text and number with the same address? We would keep it as text. That way it will accept both. And when we save it in a variable or whatever, it has to be either a number or text. So we should just keep it as text because it'll become text in a JavaScript variable anyway. We can be pretty fancy and get complex and have the numeric aspect of the address saved in one variable later and the text aspect saved in another variable that's more complex for us at the moment. So here, uh, it might not exactly work how you might expect yet, but this, what we're typing here, these inputs and such, this is plain old HTML, but type of email actually is more HTML5. 
there's no way that you would know that unless you know you learned it or I, or I told you but a, of an input type of HTML uh, an input type of email is an HTML5 construct and the theory is that the only thing that this will accept are email addresses now if I open it up in the browser it's gonna accept whatever because it's not complete yet but if I were opening it up in my uh, in my uh, in my mobile device, it would know to have email input. It would give us a keyboard that would have the at symbol because that's what an email has. If we were to uh, set this as type of number, this at the moment oh see actually it turned red because it's like this is the wrong type of input. That's cool. Um, so here now with a type of number, it got this. Oh, I can increment numbers. I can put in letters for the moment, but if I click outside, it'll say, hey, there's a problem. Not a lot of good user feedback yet, but here I'm just showing you that HTML5, type of number, type of email, there's a couple of other ones, I think date also, allow us to create these input boxes very quickly, where in the old days, we'd have to kind of program this with a lot more complexity. If I were to open this up in my mobile device, type number would only pop up a keyboard of numbers, not a keyboard of letters. For the moment, we'll keep it as text. Right now, there's no indicator really of what is the person supposed to type here. So let's back up. Before input, we'll write the label tag, which has a pair. This label is going to be text that is linked to that input box that displays on screen. The text will be name. At the moment, it works, but it doesn't know that label is supposed to be linked with this input box, so we need to connect them with attributes. For the label tag, we'll back up and do the for attribute. We're saying this label is for some input box somewhere. Because I can have 20 input boxes, which label applies with which element. So we have to link them with for. We're going to say uh, input name. We're inventing this, uh, this unique identifier right here, input name. This is an input box, so I'm calling it input name. This is our input for names. Then our input box itself, this is just one half of it. The other half of it is that the input box itself needs the attribute to say, oh, okay, this um, label is attached to that. So we will then write... Um, The name of this input box is input name. Notice both are the same then. Both of those are the same so that they can be linked together. Label and input now are linked together uh, with that unique identifier. Remember, if you highlight some code, it'll highlight everywhere throughout your code. Visually, they were linked together because they were on the same line, but now conceptually, programmatically, and in a more important way, they are linked together in the, in the software, in the app. And the result is simply that display some text, and I can put in some text. We're not done with this input box because some more cool HTML5 attributes that we can add is placeholder text. I would like to guide people, type this in here. In here, does that mean type only first name or type a full first name, last name, no spaces, yes spaces? I can program that much more advanced later. But uh, for the moment, I want to put some placeholder text that appears here to guide people. And there's an attribute called placeholder. That's easy. So let's say, at the moment, the order of these things don't quite matter, but I'm going to say, for the moment, uh, I'm going to add placeholder before the name attribute. And placeholder, then, is any text that we want to appear in the box. So I can say your name. 
whatever. We can have that say something so that the user sees that as a little guide of what they should type. If this were, for example, username, and the username has to be, you know, first letter, first name, capital, first letter of last name, capital, and then the rest lowercase, I could type an example of that in the placeholder to guide people this is what you should type. This is not going to do any sort of like input validation. They can still type in numbers. I want a name, and a person could type here one, two, three. We're not there yet. We, we haven't programmed that. Again, because it's so easy as us as the user, we type in on our bank app login, it asks for account number, and it only lets us type in numbers. Or if I accidentally type numbers and dashes, but I don't need dashes, it sees that and deals with it. We haven't done any of that, so this will accept any input at the moment. And the cool thing is I can click and it goes away as soon as I start typing. It's also very cool on a, on a mobile device. It'll display that and go away when you select it. The last attribute that this needs is a way for us to identify it in JavaScript. We saw that we had a couple of ways to do this last time, where we created a, uh, a variable that held a node list, or we identified the specific element with an ID. Either or will work, but I think it's a little more straightforward to think in terms of IDs. And personally, I like to add the ID or the class as the very last attribute. There's no right or wrong answer to this. This is just something that I like to do. I'm going to teach you this, and then you're going to like it. And the reason I like to put it at the end is when I've got hundreds of lines of code, I'm always going to know that the ID that I need to edit is always going to be at the end of the attribute or the element. Again, it doesn't matter. It could be the first item. But when I'm looking at hundreds of lines of code, I kind of have to look in here somewhere and it might be a little bit more difficult to find it when it's in here somewhere. If it's at the end of my line, I'm always going to know my uh, input's going to be there. Or my ID, that is, or class. That's why I can always find it. Both of these are the same thing. So we're going to accept a username input. Pretty good looking form so far. What's it missing? Some buttons, like a submit button. Let's program in a submit button, a submit button to do something. So next line. Make sure you're still in the field set, which is in the form. This is going to be another input. You might not think about it in those terms, but a button in a form is an input. It has a different type, though, a type of button. It has a type of button. Usually a button has some word on it. So we can add the attribute of putting words in that button, value, the value of that input button, whatever text we want here, like go or submit or send or whatever. needs an ID so that we can identify it in the JavaScript and deal with it because right now the button isn't going to do anything. We can program it up to this point but it's not going to do anything. It doesn't know to. With an ID or a class or other methods to select the element we can then have it be a trigger to do something. So we'll give it an ID, bt and go. This is a button with the value go. The ID can be anything we want to call it. some text there. Let's say you are um, filling in a form and you start to make a mistake. How do you how do you often handle that? Cancel it or reset the form to start over. So we need a, some sort of reset button to clear this to clear this field. I want to start over wrong name. 
So let's say after this input element, another input element of a different type. The type of that one is simply reset. That one's a plain old HTML 1.0 attribute. It's a reset button. By default, I think it'll just say reset, but if we wanted to say something else, how do you think we can change the, the text that appears in the button? Change the label? Yes, but how? Value. We saw we had value for the input. So we can add a value attribute to that reset button and call it something else, like cancel. So based on what I've seen already, perhaps I'm figuring out value is the way to affect the label or the text of that input. You might not think of that as input, but obviously uh, it's part of a form, so it is. check our code. So far it doesn't really do anything yet. Uh, we're setting it up. Go doesn't do anything. Cancel does. It does clear it. You might want to call it clear, cancel, whatever makes sense. For the moment we'll deal with functionality. Later on we can deal with you know, pretty aspects of it. Uh, user interface and all of that. Yes? How does the cancel Actually, that's a very good question because this cancel button would clear every field of this form. So if I have more than one input field in this form, they would all be cleared. I do have the ability based on the names and, and the IDs of particular elements to trigger only certain fields to be canceled. Okay, so this is what we've got so far. Okay, it's time to start to deal with some JavaScript. Because I need to take that user input and do something with it. So I'm going to say, uh, before we go much further, open up your console in, uh, in the web browser, F12, to open up the console, because now we're going to start to look at mm, things from a developer's point of view. We might not output stuff to the screen. Sometimes it's going to be faster to output to the console than to set ourselves up to output to the screen. We saw document.write as a way to output to the screen, but that's not the best way usually. That's a quick way to output to the screen, but uh, to really output well, we're going to see that today. And for the moment, output to the console will be a lot faster. We're going to then need after all of our HTML elements. We're going to keep it as embedded uh, JavaScript for the moment um, because this will save us some effort instead of dealing with two separate files that we have to go open the other file and edit this file and back and forth. I'm going to keep all my HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in one file, which honestly isn't best practice. Best practice is to separate HTML into an HTML file, CSS into a CSS file, and JavaScript to a JavaScript file. For the moment, we'll keep it all together. Inside of the script block, this is valid JavaScript. Um, we're going to start to use a brand new concept here that is uh, important for us to know because this will help us avoid issues in the future once we start to deal with JavaScript libraries. We'll talk about what JavaScript libraries are, but they're basically JavaScript shortcuts. We could have conflicts in code. So this is a pretty smart way that JavaScript developers have figured out a way for us to avoid these conflicts. Let's write open, close parentheses, open, close parentheses, semicolon. Let's back up inside of the first um, parentheses and we'll write function, open, close parentheses, open and close curly braces. This is an immediately invoked function function expression. It's 
a little too advanced to get into the whole details of it at the moment, but it helps us write better code. You see this a lot when you get serious in JavaScript, because there could be separate JavaScript functions and Java JavaScript commands and libraries and variables that could conflict with each other. I could have a variable called my name, but some other library or some other function also uses it, and you get these conflicts that we were expecting something to happen, but because the different parts of the code are using the same thing in a different way, it could cause problems. So we're going to put all of our JavaScript code inside of this function. We haven't quite talked about functions yet, but uh, I mentioned in the notes last time it's basically a series of steps, a recipe, our program. We're going to write our whole program, our JavaScript program, inside of this function. This is the basic structure, and we're going to start to write it inside of the curly braces. Now, I said this is going to be 100 lines of code, so we're going to break that into multiple lines. I wanted to write the whole complete expression first because 100 lines later, I'm going to forget to close that, and my app won't work. So I wrote the whole expression once, the beginning and the end of it, and then I'm going to fill in the details. But I like to show it this way because this makes more sense. When you see it in a tutorial, you see, what's this about and what does it mean? And people don't notice that at the very end of the code, there's the closing aspect of it. So all of our JavaScript will be inside of this function. We're also going to start to use what is known as JavaScript strict mode. We've been using loose mode, which worked for us, but the um, sometimes the way we write our code isn't the most um, standards compliant. It got the job done, but perhaps to be the most correct, we should write our code in strict mode. So the way this is, quote, end quote, semicolon. It's a statement, and inside the quotes we will write use space strict. This is telling the interpreter, this is telling the web browser, what follows is JavaScript code, use your strict mode, be more harsh on us, give us more error messages if we make errors. Because without strict mode there could be silent errors. There could be errors that the console doesn't give us and we don't know how to fix our problem. With using strict mode, we're telling the browser, be more strict, more harsh, and give us more errors to help us, more error output, to help us figure out our problems. Next line, a couple of enters here just for readability. We're going to create a variable, a container, we'll call it all names, equals, we need to assign a value to it. This variable, this object, will hold something. This is going to hold, guess what? All of the names that the user inputs. We have various objects um, or elements, constructs that can do this. We will use the array construct. We will use the array object to hold a simple list of names. We don't need to get that complex with last name, first name, age, and all of that. It might have been better to use a JavaScript object if we were going to ask for all of those things. For us at the moment, we just need a name, and then to retrieve the name, and that sort of thing. So, an array. And uh, previously when we wrote an array, we also wrote each value of the array, you know, a comma, b, comma, c, etc. We don't know what the user is going to put you don't know what the user is going to give us, so we're creating an empty array. We're then going to populate the array with some input. A couple of enters there. We need to have this button, button go, we need to have that button know that when we click on it, take the name that the person wrote and save it to that array. So we need to activate this button as a trigger to accomplish something. Right. Document dot get element by ID in quotes. We need to reference something on the screen to be our trigger. What are we referencing? 
ETN go. That's the button that is supposed to make this work. So we're saying, let's get that element on screen. Dot on click. This is what's known as an event handler. Um, we're saying here uh, there's some element on the screen. When someone clicks that element, do something. There's an event. We're going to handle it. We're going to click the button to do something, multiple things. Let's say equals. Here we're going to have an expression which will, which will do something. We've seen equals over here as an assignment operator. Put this array into this object. Here we're using equals, but we're going to use it as uh, an expression which will do something. We're going to say here then function. Open close parentheses space open close curly brace semicolon. This syntax right here, let's make a note. Syntax for making a button active. The function or code at right will run when the button or the element at left is clicked. We have this event this event of on click when someone clicks. We have other events such as double click. If someone double clicks something, do something. We have drag, click and drag to do something else. We have on load. We have on unload. Do you ever visit a website and you're trying to leave the website and then a pop up pops up that says, please don't leave, check this out? Well, that was an event of on unload. We're leaving a website, something gets triggered, a pop up happens. We have these events that are triggered, and then we handle the event. We're going to handle the event over here. The function is a series of steps. Just to do a very, very, very basic one here to see if, we're, if this is working so far, because there could be a few failure points so far. Let's run the alert uh, method. Save it and run it. Um, click the button. We should get a simple pop-up just to tell us it, it's working so far. We have a button which is a trigger and then we have an event handler which should be a pop-up that appears on screen. You don't have to type anything to the box. Yeah, we haven't dealt with that really. Just click the go button and you should get a pop-up that says we clicked. Let's pause here if you didn't get that. This is our code so far. Anyone need a little help? Uh, button active. The function at right will run. This is when we're going to start to look at our console output, which will hopefully help us figure out the issues. All right, so this was a this was a result. This is an expression. Usually, the equals is an assignment operator, meaning put the thing on the right into the thing on the left. In this case, instead of putting a value into an object, this is an expression in that it executes a command. Click on something, do something. So the equals had a different 
purpose here. Let's give ourselves some notes back here. Created an array, assigned an empty array. Well, created a, a variable, assigned an empty array. That's what that did. Uh, what we did here was expression to run a function after an event. So the equal did two things here. And uh, most of the time you'll know which is which. If you want to talk about what did it do, okay, that we can get into that. But you'll, you'll know what it did just by you doing what you needed to do. I needed to create an object here. Here I needed it to do something. <coughs> Expression. If you got the alert, that means you're on the right track. What we needed to do is several things. Uh, take whatever the person typed and save it in the array. That's going to be at least two more lines of code. So we are going to then say, instead of that alert, because we know that works, we are going to say uh, that this is going to run, instead of the alert method um, or function, we're going to write the name save. function. Name save. So if we put in a name here and click go, it'll save the name. Wait a minute. If I check my console, refer Reference error name save is not is not defined. So we're inventing something called name save. There's no built-in JavaScript function called name save. How would it know to save the name? Where would it save it? How would we retrieve it? So this is an example where we need to invent some code to make it do things that were not built in. Alert is built in. Again, over at developer.mozilla.org, we can look up the list of all the 200 built-in JavaScript commands. We don't need to know them all. We need to know the dozen or whatever, the five or whatever that we need to know in order to make our app do what we need it to do. And oftentimes we will create, we will be creating our own recipes, our own series of steps to accomplish what we need to do with pieces of the existing JavaScript library. So I want to run name save, which will save the name, retrieve the name, all this stuff. So we need to define that. Next line. Comment. Create the name save function, which is keyword function. Just like we created a variable up here, we're going to create a function, which should be name save, exactly as we typed it with capitalization and such up there. We're referencing something. Here's the something. We're inventing it. Space, open, curly, open close, curly braces. Ninety-nine percent of the time, we're going to put a semicolon at the end of the line, except when we create functions. It'll work, even in strict mode, I think. It'll work if we put a semicolon there at the end, as we've been doing over and over. But from all the documentation that I read and all the commentary that I read, you shouldn't put it. That's just one thing we'll have to remember. No semicolon at the end of a function declaration. declaring a function. We're inventing a function, a series of steps. Okay, since it's going to be a series of steps, we will break the curly braces into a couple of separate lines, and then inside of the um, function, function definition. We'll say var. We're going to create a variable inside of that function. And we're going to call this tmp name. We're going to temporarily hold on to that name. We're going to retrieve the name that the person typed and hold on to it temporarily in a variable. And that is going to come from whatever the person typed in the box. Document 
dot get element by ID method in quotes. What's the name of the box where the person's typing their name? Input name. The one that says name equals, or more accurately, ID equals. Because we're saying get an element by its ID. We call the input name. Um, this would put the whole object into temp name. That input box has is an object then and would have various properties, such as the width and the height of it, the font color of it, all of that stuff. The property that we care about, however, is what did they type in the box, which is dot value, semicolon. Give me only the value property of that input box and store it in this variable. Next line, console.log temp name. In the console, show that result. So give that a try. Type in a name now, click go, and watch it appear in your console. So um, if it didn't work, make sure you type name save function de declaration, the same as name save in the expression up there. And of course, all of this capitalization and such matters. Raise your hand if that worked. Are you seeing out console output? Raise your hand. No one? OK. I failed then. Anyone need any help then? Error? Okay, let's check that out. Remember, if it's giving you an error, you want to check the line number and perhaps help you get to the bottom of it and see what the error is. Zero errors. Zero errors. Yeah. It's not going to put it on screen yet. All it is up to the
All right, everyone. So, um, if we if this works so far, we're kind of seeing that we are getting some input. You know, I can put in these other names. It'll give us output in the console. Here's what I'm going to recommend. Usually, um, it might be fastest because we're going to keep looking at our console. I would recommend to just simply refresh your web browser. Yes, we have that run at the top, but if you just refresh your browser, that'll give you the latest version of the code, so you don't have to waste your time opening the console every time. And one thing I, I noticed also, uh, if you think you did everything right and you're still not getting any console output, well, we can view different kinds of console output, and we usually want the login, logging type of messages to show up. If that is off, you're not going to see anything. I think by default, you know, logging should be on. But if you're still not getting anything out there, make sure your logging output is on. Okay, so we're getting some output to the console, but we want to get it to the user. But wait a minute, I want to build my set of names. I want to store all of those names. I've got a variable, I've got an array that is supposed to be used to hold all the names that the people enter, not just one at a time, all names. So what we'll, what we'll do is we need to um, add this item to the array. So we've seen that we, we are accepting input. So next line, we will say all names the object all names exists we created it um, and this has a method dot push open close parentheses the array object has a, a bunch of built-in methods a bunch of built-in functions a bunch of built-in you know steps that these things can do or actions uh, the push action the push method we're gonna push something into this array well the something obviously is temp name Every time a person types a name, put it into the array, and the put is called push. In the uh, next line, I then want to say, okay, in the lo in the console, show me now all names. Start showing me the names that I'm putting into the array as I keep putting in it in there. Now save and refresh that. Type in a name. It'll show it to you twice because we've got two two logs. So you might want to comment that one out. We know that up, it works up to that point. Um, then we've got this other console log. Where now we're starting to show the array. Let me check if that works. I'm going to refresh my code. I'm going to put one name. So it showed the name, and then it shows it as as part of an array. Okay, I'm going to put in the next name. It's going to show me the current name that I put in, and now the array consists of these two items. Third name. Now the array has three names, and the fourth name. So this array has four items. There's our code so far. It's the name of the array dot push. And what are we pushing or what are we putting into the array? The name that we've temporarily captured. Ooh. 
So if that works, we're on track, we're starting to save data to the array now. Do you notice that I type in a name? I want to add a new name. It still remembers the current name. I have to go in and either cancel or delete it. Then I can type in a new name. That's annoying. I have to, I want I need to, I would like for that to go away so I can type in a new name. Again, as the user, we take all of that for granted. That stuff just works. I type in something, the the computer does the result without me thinking about it. Me as a programmer, I now have to think about all of this. The default does not clear the input box. So I have to also clear that input box to accept the new name. So next line. Next line is document dot get element by ID. We're talking about that input name again. Dot value space equals quote end quote semicolon. Whatever value is currently in that input box, set it to nothing. Clear it. There's many ways to do these things as, as I've said. This is one way. This is a pretty obvious way. Set whatever's there to blank, to empty, to nothing, technically to null. It's, uh, it's empty. There's nothing in the box, which makes our placeholder text come back. So the purpose of that is that I type something, click go, it took my input and it also cleared the box. Simple thing that we take for granted on other software, since we are the architects then of the software, we have to keep those things in mind. We could have left it perfectly alone without that line, it would have all functioned. But then we would be neglecting an aspect of um, programming that a lot of programmers neglect, which is user experience. And perhaps I might say, well, that's not my job. There's a person on the team that is user experience. But uh, we do need to touch on all of these concepts because if we are programming our own app, we're the app developer, we need to take everything into account. Eventually, graphics and text maybe animation, user experience, user interface, all of that stuff, not just the programming. I may be a pro and write 500 lines, no problem, but I also have to deal with a pretty graphic, and I have to deal with how does it work to the user. For me as a programmer, it works, but for the user, the person that's going to use your software, does it work for them? And that's often a hard thing to, for programmers to deal with. Uh, the joke oftentimes is that you know Google can create a lot of um, ugly-looking great things because a lot of the times the Google stuff that coming out of Google for a long time was not that nice looking. It was very functional and great, but visually it wasn't that good. Recently, in the last several years, of course, Google stuff looks good, material design. But in the old days, the stuff didn't look that good, but it functioned well. So we're starting to save data to the array. We want to then start to deal with Okay, showing it to the user. Right now it shows up for the developer, but it doesn't show up for the user yet. One half of the puzzle is, de is done, the other half is displaying it, and then displaying it randomly and all that good stuff. But we'll take our first break, uh, and then we'll come back and we'll start to then show data to the user. 7.10, we'll be back at 7.20, and we'll go on.